Like any post-apocalyptic yeehaw fun time happy zone, a big theme you'll see in New Vegas is societal regression. The return, or attempts to return, to the way we lived back in the good old days. You remember the good old days? Back when the wealthy put democracy in a bureaucratic stranglehold. Back when cults of personality took advantage of the uneducated masses. When those deemed unnecessary for the bigger picture were left homeless and starved. You know, the good old days. The past. But I want to talk a bit more about this shiny looking bit of past over here. Despite the familiar comforts of neon signs and predatory gambling practices, the city of New Vegas is actually a pretty tough nut to crack. Not for a lack of explanation, I mean, Mr. House will tell you all about how he saved New Vegas, how he plans to expand it, and how he'll totally be responsible with all of his gambling money and his private robot army because he's just a cool guy, don't you trust cool guys? But what House wants New Vegas to be is a very different vision from what it presently is is. So, what is it? Well, you got the strip in the middle, then a wall surrounding it, some poor people, then another wall, more poor people, a few crops. Is New Vegas a medieval city? I mean, like, obviously it, it isn't, but what's going on here? Let's start by defining what here actually is. We're not just talking about the strip, or as House calls it, the free economic zone of New Vegas, but the New Vegas metropolitan area. Or maybe it would technically be a micropolitan area? I don't know. Either way, I would say it looks something like this. This isn't an exact map by any means. I mean, there's not really any clearly drawn borders anywhere in the game for this, but I think that anyone who lives in this sort of region can reasonably say they live in New Vegas. Already, we've got some annoying questions to deal with, like, what about the NCR installations? Is Camp McCarran really a part of New Vegas? I mean, it is right there. And NCR staff is a big portion of traffic into the Strip. But the base itself is NCR territory owned and operated by the NCR. And while they might visit or even occasionally play nice with the local community, are they really a part of it? Well, let's look at real life. Are U.S. military bases abroad really a part of their local communities? Well, uh, I mean, you, uh, you, you know, uh, let, let's go back to the game, actually. Camp McCarran is a strategic stronghold. I mean, yeah, all military bases are strategic strongholds by definition, but McCarran is near the front lines of an active war zone and exists primarily to facilitate warfare in the surrounding area. It doesn't do any of those things that your typical base that's just in the middle of your country might do, like hold training exercises or send all of your citizens' private communications data through international networks. It's a real war base. It's there to send warm bodies into the meat grinder. So. In summary, Camp McCarran, kind of part of New Vegas, but not really. The troops stationed there are pretty important for keeping the strip running, but they're tourists, not locals. The base itself is confined and it relies on NCR supplies as well, as opposed to the casinos which negotiate with Brahmin barons or places like Freeside who enjoy uh, street food. So with that out of the way and the fiends firmly ignored, let's start on the outside and work our way in. West Side, North Vegas Square, and the sewers. Outer Vegas. Home to drugs, crime, and a co-op. What primarily sets these places apart from Freeside is the giant wall between them. But they also have very different outlooks on life. Where Freeside is living directly in the shadow of the Strip's bright lights, the communities in Outer Vegas feel a lot more... sober, in a weird way. And not to imply that they aren't riddled with drug problems like the rest of Vegas, they definitely are. But they're also trying to put something together for themselves instead of depending on the Strip's leftovers for survival. Displaced and disorganized as they are, the New Vegas citizens that you encounter in the sewers are just trying to eat, sleep, and not get killed. Which kind of begs the question, how do they eat? Uh, well, crops, mostly, as far as I can see, but just growing crops isn't enough. For communities of this size to stabilize and grow, you have to trade the crops, too. Population counts tend to grow a lot faster than crop yields, so you have to make the most of your harvest by using it to negotiate for stuff. It's Economics 101. But these are the kinds of things that you do have to rebuild after everything has been destroyed. And Outer Vegas is making an admirable, if small, attempt at it. Admirable. 
not admiral. I don't, I don't know why I... Speaking of rebuilding, look at the scrap construction at hand on these walls. The walls for Freeside and the Strip were built by houses robots, but this, this is local labor. And while not nearly as impressive or complete as the walls of Freeside, these might be the biggest indicator that the people of Outer Vegas are really invested in themselves. They ain't given to relying on others for support, and they will gladly tell you that to your face. Fuck off. What I think is maybe the most interesting about the Outer Vegas communities is that officially, there are no officials. And while that's not really unique at all in the greater wasteland, Outer Vegas sits in this stark contrast not just to the Strip, under House's Iron Grip, but also Freeside, which is kind of held together by the groups like the Kings and the Followers. In places like Westside, there's a sort of unsaid understanding that working as a collective is in the best interests of the individual. Instead of a department of officers appointed to uphold the law, the people are really directly policing themselves, either as lone vigilantes or a group militia. Again, you might see similar approaches in small towns like Good Springs or Novak, but here, the desperation of trying to survive keeps things brutally honest. Good Springs doesn't have to worry about fiends dropping in and causing a ruckus. When you have junkies quite literally breathing down your neck at night, drama, like all things, is short-lived. So if we wanted to compare this to a real-life model of society, we'd probably start by looking at the small pre-feudal towns of Northern Europe, occupied by small groups of relatively free laborers trying to make a living. Not entirely different lives on the surface, but there is a tiny catch here that we are missing. Uh, New Vegas is in the post-apocalypse. If you look at the historical city, usually you'll see a settlement, backed by a local trade or industry of some kind, that then grew into a town which blossomed into a city. And that's very much the case for Las Vegas. But New Vegas kinda went the other way around. House started, or restarted, with a pre-built city, and only a vault full of people to live in it. So he invited a few of the locals, pushed the leftovers out into Freeside, and the remainder scattered to Outer Vegas. And as far as city development goes, that's pretty backwards. And you can see that in how these layers interact. Or more accurately, I guess, how they don't interact. Freeside is living off the trickle-down of a desert cactus. And that's basically the only kind of exchange or support that happens between these walls. The Outer Vegas communities have basically nothing to do with Freeside and absolutely nothing to do with the Strip. The only real connection that these places have with each other is their proximity to the Strip. You could think of the Strip as this bright star that all these places orbit, some closely, some more distant, and that distance, both physical and maybe even socioeconomic too, is what dictates their relationships. As natural as that metaphor might sound, I, I don't actually think House's policy of you stay over there, I stay over here can really be considered natural, but we'll come back to that. These small collectives don't really have the same bargaining power as a strip casino, so if you want to see some business and trade really happen, you have to go a layer deeper. Freeside carries with it the same trademarks of poverty and desperation that you'll find in Outer Vegas, but interspersed with a few pockets of business. Your street-side hustlers and deserted building entrepreneurs are still here in spades, but there are a few groups here who have really made homes out of the abandoned houses that House abandoned. Let's talk a little bit about city planning. Las Vegas sprouted from an old Mormon fort on Paiute dirt, and eventually, with the development of railroads, the dam, and a little bit of organized crime, grew into the gambling capital of the U.S. And yes, that is a dramatic reduction of over 100 years of history, but if I didn't do that, this video would be longer than <laughs> The key takeaway is that Las Vegas, like any city, was planned, organized, and managed, at least to some extent. To build, there are codes. To perform, there are permits. Anywhere there's work, paper is not far behind. If you want to wait at a red light, First, you have to wait at the DMV. Such is the reality of urbanized life. Look, I know right there was the perfect opportunity to show that clip of libertarians booing the concept of driver's licenses, but like, come on, I can't just derail the video every time there's a chance to... Oh, okay, just this once. Should someone have to have a government-issued license to drive a car? Hell no! The license to drive? Yeah. 
you know, I'd like to see some competency exhibited by people before they drive. Okay, what was I talking about? Oh, right. Uh, urbanized life. The more people you get together, the more red tape tends to build up. Contrast that with life in a rural area where you can drive your lawnmower right up to the road because you have the power of God. One of the best ways to visualize this actually does lie in roads. Take the square city grid versus the tangled spaghetti that was built on whatever was convenient a thousand years ago. We can refer to these two ways of laying out your city as urban and pre-urban. Even though those aren't technically the best terms to describe them, because grid design is not exclusive to cities and road spaghetti isn't exclusive to rural areas, but look, just, just let me have this please, I'm so tired. Freeside, structurally, is urban, obviously. It's part of a modern city. But broadly speaking, the people living in Freeside don't live traditionally urban lives. There are a few small opportunities where you can pick up a job if you're lucky, but the vast majority of people are just spending their time trying to literally scrape up whatever they can find lying around. With that in mind, it might be tempting to say that the people in Freeside are living pre-urban lives in an urban environment, and that just like the citizens in Outer Vegas or the villagers of ye olden time, Freeside is focused on localized survival. But is it really the same? You might expect an urban area densely packed with buildings to be equally packed with the staples of urban society, but again, we have to remember, New Vegas was repopulated after it was built, long after. The buildings originally propped up on Fremont Street were not built with starving post-apocalyptic people in mind. So unless the occupants have the ability to repurpose or reuse the facilities already there, they are stuck with whatever's around and what's around is pawn shops and celebrity worship halls. So Freeside doesn't produce very much. And while it does have trade and trades, they're really insular. Mick and Ralph sells small knickknacks and larger, deadlier knickknacks. Silver Rush sells energy weapons that none of the locals can really afford, but they do occasionally hire a new person, I guess, so there's that. And the Atomic Wrangler is a casino. So that's your biggest employer. The groups keeping Freeside afloat, and afloat is a very generous word, are not money makers. They're humanitarians and Elvis impersonators. And even with their help, life here is just as dire as life outside the wall, even if it is slightly less dangerous. In one of Mr. New Vegas' reports, the king refers to Freeside as the ghetto. And I really can't think of a better word for Freeside than that. It isn't a place people choose to live, it's where they're pushed. So naturally, the little pockets of people that form are way more concerned about their own well-being than that of Freeside or New Vegas as a whole. There's plenty of these small groups, but very little community between them. And with poverty bringing the usual fun that it does, of course Freeside is a crime-ridden hellhole. Not to mention the shining beacon of greed and general all-purpose sin that hovers over them. Speaking of, the free economic zone of New Vegas. All right, you wanna know what's really going on here? You wanna know what this is all about? This ain't your grandpappy's free market libertarianism, oh no. This is partially automated luxury casino capitalism. You might wonder how that differs from the Vegas of today, but Las Vegas is a big metropolitan city. Tourism and gambling are no doubt big draws for the city, but it has plenty of industry and business outside of it. Contrast that with New Vegas, which doesn't produce enough food, electricity, or any of the basics you need to sustain a population. The Great War left all of the businesses outside of the Strip in ruin, so House went all in on the casinos. The casinos bring in the food, the electricity, and, of course, those sweet, sweet tourist caps. Being the cash cows of Vegas, House gives them a generous amount of leeway because he literally can't afford for them to fail. They're the backbone of his economy and the foundation of his plans. They have to operate without fail and with as few PR accidents as possible. And while all that serves as a great setting for fictional cannibalism, New Vegas actually has some more realistic parallels, and I'm not even just referring to Las Vegas. And just look at Macau. Formerly a Portuguese colony, now a special administrative region of China, 
Macau is home to the largest gambling economy in the world. We're talking multiple times larger than Las Vegas. 86% of Macau's total tax revenue came from gambling in 2017. For reference, Las Vegas's two biggest tax draws that year came from property tax and consolidated taxes, which together made up about 52% of its total revenue. I sound like the terrorist leader from Deus Ex. Now, about these two names, they sound pretty different, especially with the context of China's <coughs> oppressive, sorry, hands-on approach with formerly independent territories. But in terms of how they're structured, how policy is not just bent, but straight up written with casino profits put first, how the local economy completely relies on outside tourist populations and food is imported due to a lack of farming capability, you get the idea. Casino capitalism is a surprisingly real thing, not to be confused with casino capitalism. That's, that's a different concept. That's like about speculative markets. No, this is, this is literally casino capitalism. I don't know. Maybe there should be a dash. It's kind of confusing. But despite all the revenue it makes, the wealth gap still tends to be pretty gappy. If the segmented layers of poverty surrounding the Strip didn't make it obvious enough, you can still find poor souls aplenty in and around the gambling halls. And not just the gamblers, but the workers as well. Maybe this is just as true today, but it feels like the Strip is designed to devour you and spit your bones back out over the walls. The light that the Lucky 38 shines out into the Mojave might as well be dangling from an angler fish, just inviting you into its jaws. At least if you're an NCR trooper, you'll have a base and a bunk to return to, but woe unto anyone who enters the belly of the beast in their own time, on their own dime. Walking the street, you're greeted by a strange mix of robotic stares, drunken stumbles, and seductive dances. I guess the hospitality of a casino is a lot more attractive when walking outside is like browsing a museum of human failure. The bold shapes and neon lights contrast pretty sharply with the centuries of wear and tear on the buildings, and that's just the outside. Imagine how Gamora smells. Still, this bizarre little strip of road might be the most familiar thing in the Mojave for an NCR citizen. Drinks, entertainment, working streetlights, out west they might call a lot of these things amenities, but in a place so desolate that people play caravan for fun, playing a slot machine must feel like crack cocaine by comparison. Might be just as profitable too. House calls the Legion and NCR regurgitations of the past, which is definitely true, but I think if we're being completely honest here, he isn't exactly trailblazing either. His cutthroat, goals-oriented approach isn't a product of post-war desperation. It's exactly how he ran Robco Industries before the war. In that respect, the main difference between the Strip and Robco is where the money comes from. Instead of big venture capital funds or government contracts, the Lucky 38 siphons its profits directly from below. First from the casinos, then the casinos from the gamblers. Freeside isn't a slum just because there happens to be a bunch of poor people living there. It's because they live next door to the poor people factory. House's strip doesn't just allow for this kind of wealth disparity, it creates it. It demands it in the name of progress, which House thinks of as a bunch of technological benchmarks rather than, uh, oh, I don't know, trying to raise the standard of human living. Maybe House's most famous quote is, if you want to see the fate of democracies, look out the windows. And a lot of people take this as an indictment of the governments that led to the Great War. But I think that sentence is just as much a testament to the survival of a parasite. A parasite that sustains itself on conflict, first in Robco's giant military contracts, now in the Strip's position as a tourist trap for soldiers. House does not want to legislate, provide, or generally care for people unless they're customers. Then, and only then, will they be granted the luxury of being robbed. And that isn't just a euphemism for the dangers of unchecked capitalism. That is how you run a profitable casino.